The first speaker is uh, Professor S.G. Dunny. Professor Dunny did his master's from the University of Mumbai in 1969, PhD from TIFR in 1975. After that, he joined TIFR as a faculty. He was a visiting scholar at the Institute of Advanced Study during 1976-77 and 1983-84. He has been a member of the National Board of Higher Mathematics since 1996 and was the chairman of the NBHM. Danny was awarded the Shantisharu Bhatnagar Prize in 1990. He received the Third World Academy of Sciences Prize in 2007. Professor Dani has been very active in debunking the claims of the so-called Vedic mathematics he has written numerous articles and given several talks on the topic. So I request Professor Dunny to present his uh, speech. His topic is his topic is on issues of scientific validation in everyday life. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the kind introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here on, on this occasion to be uh, saying a few things on the uh, topic that I have chosen on uh, issues of scientific validation in everyday life. Now, uh, over the century, every, everybody is aware that, the, that science has uh, brought to uh, society in, in uh, many ways, primarily technological as well as uh, very, uh, in terms of knowledge and so on. But somehow the thought that this has more to do than just the benefits has not uh, reached the society. That's something that is uh, uh, to be noted. I mean, the, it's, uh, science is not just uh, something that you can use, but also provides a certain way of life is something that is not realized. and. Uh, uh, I hope some uh, conferences and meetings like this go some way uh, in uh, reaching the, this point to the society. Now, in, it was uh, men, uh, uh, one of the quotes you might recall from the inaugural uh, talk of Professor Das was that science is nothing but uh, refinement of everyday thinking. So in a way, it's actually something that is ingrained in us, but nevertheless, it, we, we, have, uh, uh, we have not uh, met it at full strength, and, that, and that's something that we need to, need to do. So uh, to sort, sort of bring in this point, I think I'm going to start with uh, the very simple mundane example of everyday life. Let's say a note of uh, 2,000 rupees note is missing from your wallet. So how would your thoughts go on such an occasion, on realizing the loss? So there, here are some options. Try to recall whether you spent, uh, spent that on something, whether you left the wallet somewhere and uh, where maybe the note was stolen. Maybe it's still there in a different color. Maybe it changed color, and uh, you might look for it, uh, look for it uh, in alternate colors. Perhaps a demon gobbled it, but it'll, maybe it'll reappear and divine chastisement for some, some wrongdoing. Now, I'm sure many of you would have come across such possibilities, but you would agree that all normal people would discount all the later uh, options. Why? And the simple reason is that as we grow up, we develop a certain sense of what can happen and what cannot. Knowledge consists of putting our experiences into patterns that guide us. Persistence of an experience and the collective nature of uh, play an important role in uh, accepting it. We also learn to exclude situations such as uh, magic shows from the inputs to count on. Okay, but here is a parallel example. Now consider another example. How do eclipses happen? So the question can be rephrased as where is the rest of the moon? So some part of the moon is covered and so what happened to the, to the moon? 
and uh, you would often you, you would have uh, grown up with the explanation that Rahu did gobble it up, but you know that it, Rahu did not gobble it up. Part is the, the part is just covered by Earth, Earth's shadow. Now we know this, and as well it was it was also known all the way, uh, way from the time of, from uh, to to Brahmagupta, the astronomer, mathematical astronomer from seventh century India that there was no gobbling up of the uh, uh, moon. Unfortunately, many astronomers of that time kept up uh, pretense of the legend of Rahu in deference or pressure from the, in, with their, under the dominant idea of, the, of an earlier era. I mean, even uh, this is where, where, when we talk of ancient mathematics or ancient astronomy, it is usually about uh, the early uh, decades of the first millennium, but before that, we, there, there was a certain tradition which, which was sort of not based on uh, exploration or, uh, 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 but rather more on speculation. And at that time, there was a legend, and the and the, for uh, more were rather complicated reasons that will not spend time on. The, the, the pretense was kept up. Okay, so uh, just conclude that there is no need to uh, observe fast during an eclipse which uh, I'm afraid people still might still be doing, as was pointed out in the inaugural address. Now, uh, the eclipses are, of course, uh, old hat, so I'll not spend more time on that. But let me just uh, recall that regarding so, uh, solar eclipses, there are, there are even more pernicious superstitions. Of course, uh, we all know that it's not safe to view a solar eclipse. And uh, it was sort of learned by humanity in a hard way. Uh, it's, also, it's because of the ultraviolet radiation, which you might pick up. Uh, uh, we, are, we are more vulnerable to pick up uh, for reasons that you know uh, <coughs> during eclipses. However, the prevalent myth is that uh, the <coughs> sun emits harmful rays during the eclipse, and we should stay indoors and uh, should fast during the period, etc. And uh, uh, as uh, the purveyors of uh, the, this kind of uh, formulations learn more and more technical science there are more technical more and more technical variations of this but none of them have any factual basis let's move on so uh, very such, such uh, examples illustrate the following basic principles genuine knowledge grows as cumulative as a cumulative body through putting together experiences in a coherent form forming hypotheses based on them testing the hypothesis, identifying limitations of the hypothesis through multiple applications, and modifying wherever appropriate, etc. That is the essence of the scientific method. Greater or better the evidence for a hypothesis, greater is its credibility. And one should also emphasize that the credibility is never absolute. Science has, uh, does not try to tell a final word on anything. It, we are always open to uh, modifying whenever necessary. Let me also emphasize here the collective nature of uh, the uh, scientific hypothesis. It, it, if, some, uh, an, if some individual anecdotal experiences are not, uh, do not count. Uh, you might all recall the uh, common saying that <coughs> Uh, one, uh, one, one can fool all the people all the time. Uh, one, one can fool uh, all, all the people sometime. One can fool some people for uh, some people all the time, but one cannot fool uh, all the people all the time. And knowledge consists of uh, of exactly not being fooled. So uh, it is important that there is a collective aspect that uh, that uh, uh, needs to be observed. Uh, here's a quotation from, uh, as far as the uh, reason-based thinking is concerned, here's a quotation I kind of like. Uh, it's a quotation by, from uh, Ibn al-Haytham. Uh, I, I do hope uh, the audience is familiar with, uh, with this name, a very important scientist from the Arab world, from, uh, from 10th century Basra. Renowned, he's renowned for his work on uh, optics. Uh, the uh, <coughs> <coughs> the uh, thousand, thousand year of uh, light was observed in memory of some of his uh, work. And uh, is also known <coughs> as a very early practitioner of uh, the scientific method. Is, as uh, this quotation will, would illustrate, the duty of the man, uh, if learning the truth is his goal, 
is to make himself an enemy of all that he reads and attack it from every side. He should also suspect himself as he performs his critical examination of it so that he may avoid falling into either prejudice or leniency. I mean, uh, it's a very careful statement about what are, what are all the pitfalls in, uh, that uh, you might lead you astray from correct way of thinking. Now, uh, <coughs> uh, there's generally a criticism that scientific method, science, etc., that people, uh, rational thinking, etc., that we uh, talk about is uh, uh, something uh, uh, of, an West, of a Western import and, uh, the, and that's used as an excuse against it. But first of all, as I pointed out already, it's not, nothing particularly Western. There is the, it was there already in the uh, in 10th century uh, uh, with the uh, Arabs in a very refined way. Uh, and not only that, even in, in India also, there is a substantial tradition of evidence-based uh, and reasoning-based uh, thinking. So I'd like to recall some of the things that uh, some of the audience may, perhaps may not be aware. The, now, uh, as you know, the Indian tradition sort of uh, goes back uh, in the public consciousness, at least, and up to, uh, to the time of Vedas. Of course, there is an Indian tradition even earlier, but uh, that's what we tend to associate, uh, or at least the, the dominant section seems to associate itself with, the <coughs> with that period. But even in the Vedic tradition, the Mimasa works, or Shabara and Prabhakara and the Kumari Labatta, they did not, <coughs> they are... <clears throat> they were given to uh, evidence-based and reason-based thinking. They did not believe in, uh, for instance, they did not believe in the existence of God, and the reason was that there is no uh, evidence to believe, uh, to, the, to us that belief. They rejected the idea of maya, I mean, the, no, Brahma, Satya, Maya, uh, Jagan, uh, and uh, everything else is maya, is, is a kind of standard uh, uh, thought. That, that has uh, percolated, but uh, the, the, uh, <coughs> these uh, intellectuals of the time from the Vedic tradition did not actually believe in that, and uh, they, they believed in a world that is reconstructed from sense experiences, uh, and though in spite of the fact that they were a part of the Vedic tradition. Outside the Vedic tradition, in fact, there are many other uh, thinkers who did not subscribe to the uh, <coughs> idealist thinking, among them, there is the Lokayata tradition about which I'll say a little more. Then, <coughs> the, the, uh, from the of the six darshanas, one knows that Sankhya and Vaisheshika darshan, and Nyaya Vaisheshika uh, darshanas also have uh, uh, are given to rational uh, thinking. Uh, there is also the uh, Yoga Vasishta. This is probably not very uh, well known uh, as well known as it should be. Yoga Vasishta is supposed to be the teachings of Vasishta to Rama when he uh, Ra Rama was uh, uh, apparently afflicted by uh, Vairagya, that is uh, re 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 a sense of renunciation. But uh, <coughs> and but it's it's a, a very detailed. Uh, <clears throat> advice from uh, meant sup and supposedly from Vasishta to Rama, but and uh, in interestingly, the the basic kernel of this is very materialist in, in uh, outlook. In the same way, uh, Buddhist philosophy also has uh, is uh, based on rational thinking. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the Lokayata tradition that I mentioned uh, often pejoratively referred in the later uh, by the critics as the Charvaka tradition. Uh, this, it has not come down to us in the original works. <coughs> these uh, were destroyed. I mean, they, these uh, maybe either they were consciously because by because of the hostility to that, or maybe in the course of time they they did not survive. But uh, we, are, we are aware of them only through the uh, uh, critiques uh, from by their detractors. So uh, 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 it's only when somebody is trying to criticize, uh, when somebody is trying to criticize a certain theory, you get to know something about wh what was said, and you need to uh, put it in a in a coherent form because the detractors usually would have distorted uh, <coughs> what has been said. Now here are some instances of the uh, thinking in the uh, Lokayata tradition. Purandara, uh, a Lokayatika, is known to he is known to admit usefulness of inference in determining the nature of all worldly things, where perceptual experience 
uh, is available. So you, you can use inference so long as the, uh, the con conclusion is amenable to experience. Uh, and we'll come to more of that as we proceed. But held that it cannot be employ employed in establishing a dogma reg regarding the transcendental world for which sense perception is not available. In the Sankhya and the other schools that I mentioned, uh, I'd like to mention one particular thing. <coughs> They believed in the atomic theory of matter. This is, uh, I think, uh, you would all have heard that uh, the, the, uh, people often mention with pride that we had the atomic theory long before the West, etc. And here I am going to give you some details about, uh, uh, discuss some, de uh, talk about some details about that. Firstly, it should be mentioned that the people who talked of the atomic theory, they were not from the mainstream of uh, Indian uh, intellectual tradition. They were actually the rational thinkers. The <coughs> Uh, atomic theory uh, was initiated by uh, Kanada and later developed by various people like uh, Gautama is one of the names, etc. And uh, they were in fact heavily criticized by the traditionalists as being Vedic. Though now it might find a so uh, being a source of pride, it was, uh, in its own time it was heavily criticized, uh, including by Shankaracharya, one of the very uh, pr pronounced leaders of uh, the uh, tradition, as being one of, uh, I mean, there was, he had other arguments, but one of the things was that it was charged, one of the charges was that it is un-Vedic. The Vedas do not say it, so it cannot be so, but uh, <clears throat> uh, this is clearly an instance of uh, standing for reason-based conclusion in opposition to the uh, prevalent authority. Though uh, the reasoning itself, uh, about which about which I'm going to tell you briefly, uh, may not uh, seem to meet uh, uh, contemporary standards. In modern terms, the argument uh, was essentially that if matter was to be continuous rather than atomic then because of their inf uh, infinitude of the, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 of the samples, the uh, large amount and small amount uh, could not be distinguishable. So the variety of physical properties that we find uh, would not uh, appear. So that they, are, that they appear should, must mean that uh, the matter cons uh, consists of uh, discrete units. So, I mean, there, there can be elaborations on this and there, there were uh, de detailed discussions, we'll not go into. But note that there is a certain kernel of the argument and uh, we, we, on the basis of which it was assumed. So, there, I want to point out to both, both the things that there is a kernel of the argument and on the other hand, the argument itself is, <coughs> is, all, is uh, open to question and it could have been discussed further and somehow uh, the discussions did not go far enough to lead to the more satisfactory theory. Okay, so now uh, let me change the section, uh, <coughs> uh, change track. So let's analyze the knowledge acquisition has two main components. Uh, the one is the inputs through a sense perception coupled with experimentation and inference. The latter is also very important. Uh, uh, why I said, say this will be clear as, as we proceed a little. In the 19th century, excessive importance was given to the former and use of inference was uh, <coughs> viewed with hostility. Actually, this might, uh, before I go further, I might also recall to you that uh, this is like, uh, you might actually meet some people who say that I don't believe in anything that I, don't, I, I cannot see or I, I cannot uh, experience. Like the <coughs> famous uh, leader of ours who said that uh, uh, the theory of evolution is not possible because none of our ancestors ever saw a monkey uh, getting trans changed, changed to man. So, so if you don't, uh, they, if one did not see and did not record such a thing, uh, the argument is that it did not happen. So <coughs> this is of course a more extreme and uh, rather vulgar example of uh, <coughs> uh, depending exclusively on sense perception. Uh, but uh, a somewhat more uh, uh, subtle form of uh, uh, the same thing uh, was prevalent in the uh, <coughs> last uh, 19th and 20th centuries and uh, uh, positivism, you must have read in the uh, flyers of, and uh, information about the conference about this name about uh, positivism. So positivism ruled uh, the scientific practice. It, it, uh, the emphasis there, we, uh, we will not go more into the details, but the, the point there is that uh, uh, for uh, in 
in acknowledging something as uh, knowledge, we need to need to be able to see it or experience it. So under it, it's, uh, the main crucial issue that came up at that time under its impact, most physicists did not recognize existence of atoms and molecule, molecules because we cannot see them. Boltzmann was uh, one of the major victims of this as the kinetic theory of gases, as you know, uh, sort of it depended on uh, the conceptualization of uh, atoms and molecules and uh, analyzing, uh, starting with that as the basis. And uh, since the, uh, he did not uh, get due recognition for that, which sort of uh, made him very dejected and, and finally he actually committed suicide. So this is one of the very tragic instances of uh, the uh, denial because of uh, uh, because of that okay so <clears throat> the tendency of excessive focus on observed data overlooks the fact that apart from the senses that we have uh, apart from our senses through which we perceive things we also have an innate facility for drawing inference and inference can be of uh, two kinds. One is uh, inductive inference, that if you see things, something happening repeatedly, then you conclude that the, 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 it must be happening all the time. And uh, deductive, so if uh, uh, one leads to another and so the, that leads to the third one, then the first one lead, must lead to the third one. So there, there are two types of uh, inference, that uh, two basic main types of inference that we uh, use and uh, have been using uh, since we uh, developed as a species. Okay. Of course, people, philosophers have analyzed the uh, structure of uh, these uh, kind of inference uh, methods, etc. We will not, will not go into that, but uh, it should suffice to sort of see that there are two, uh, two main aspects of this. Now, <coughs> Well, so uh, uh, if it were only that, uh, just with this, everything should be very simple. But there is a difficulty with it, is that uh, the application is vulnerable to, to flaws. This is, uh, and the reason is that unjustifiable can be, uh, conclusions can be passed off as inference to, to, to uh, see which inference is valid and which inference is not valid becomes uh, tricky and that is, that is the point. Uh, and uh, that is what uh, motivated, inspired, or was, was the reason behind the, uh, the rise of, the, of positivism, uh, because uh, when people didn't want to believe in ghosts and pe people didn't want to believe, I mean, the, uh, rationally enough, and uh, the, the anchor they want to, which they wanted to make for that was just the observations, but uh, it ignored that seemed at a certain gross level, one can say, that they igno it ignored the uh, facility of uh, inference. So the trick, therefore, however, is to control the process rather than being hostile to it. So in, in physics, the effect of positivism was overcome in the 20th century thanks to the rethinking among scientists in which Einstein played a very important role. Uh, and that led to the modern framework of scientific materialism. So uh, a brief about uh, Einstein's uh, work. The, uh, uh, through work on the relation of, uh, between viscosity and co uh, coefficient of diffusion, Einstein deduced that molecules are a physical reality. It's not uh, <clears throat> uh, just because we do not see them, we do, uh, cannot ignore them uh, as uh, purely as hypothetical or conjectural things. In as much as uh, th that we can determine their uh, dimension. Dimension was the first thing. Uh, uh, of, of their size, that you can discuss the size of uh, the molecules, etc., was one of the crucial things. Then the work on Brownian motion further bolstered the reality of uh, molecules uh, and enabled further understanding of uh, their other physical attributes. So, we, so uh, the fact that you can discuss various physical attributes of uh, atoms and molecules make the convinced more and more scientists that they do, you can think of them as reality. His celebrated work on the photoelectric effect showed that uh, quanta of energy, which were formulated by Ma Max Planck, were also in fact real uh, aspects of reality. The, it's uh, under, uh, something that is uh, fundamental to the uh, underlying reality. So these are some of the profound achievements uh, of the power of inference. Via modeling, so the, what does one do? Uh, modeling. Uh, 
and modeling the phenomena in terms of new concepts, deducing consequences from the model that are uh, deduce con the model itself, uh, the basic concepts that you think of, like atoms, molecules themselves, may not be something that, uh, that are tangible. What, but what you do is that deduce consequence of the, of the consequences of the model and that are testable experimentally. And if the conclusions are confirmed satisfactorily, then we are, we are assured of the reality of the concept. OK. <coughs> Now, uh, that's the basic framework in which, uh, through which knowledge can be solidified, consolidated, validated. Now, uh, in, uh, for, for a lot of experimental uh, uh, disciplines, this has worked quite well, this, uh, in the, especially in the last century or so, and more and more uh, <coughs> uh, conceptualization has, has occurred. I mean, uh, the Bose-Einstein Bose statistics and things like that are many more examples will, which, will, which I'll not go into. The, I want to say a few things about uh, the, <coughs> the application, uh, 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 in the, in the practical context. So the, in the, the corrupting, there are, uh, the point in the uh, extended, in extending these outside, there is that there, there are various corrupting uh, factors. So in, we have uh, our emotions like love, hate, pride, hostility, et cetera. And at a collective level, there are also, there are also business interests, political interests, professional interests, and professional by professional interests, you mean, uh, one means that uh, if one is in a job uh, uh, appointed for a certain purpose, then you would like certain tests to, to actually come out to be true, come out to be valid rather than otherwise, and then there is a, there is a sort of uh, preference, the, this kind of preference reflects in twisting uh, the findings. So there's also the confirmation bias. So the, you're more likely to uh, <coughs> see things that you want to believe rather than uh, the, you don't, uh, you are against. So one needs to counter these aspects consciously and for effective use of uh, inference process and uh, pro uh, pro uh, in the process of acquisition. Now here is an example. It's a simple-minded example, but I think it's interesting. So <coughs> uh, in a recent video, uh, promoting uh, Gomutra, you probably, many of you, uh, I imagine, may have seen it. The following demonstration is carried out. Take a glass of water and put some drops of betadine in it. This produces a dark colored liquid. Then mix some Gomutra with it, with it uh, and stir it. This turns the solution back into a transparent liquid. Now the presenter elaborately concludes. Now the presenter likens the old, uh, the st starting <coughs> uh, glass of water to human body, uh, which is pure to begin with, maybe as a, as a child, and then the various poisons get into it, and then mix betadine, um, uh, and then uh, Gomutra neutralize. So the, uh, with this elaborate analogy, uh, he, uh, <coughs> presenter elaborately concludes that uh, Gomutra neutralizes poisons and recommends it for regular consumption for healthy life as uh, the reasoning being that uh, as the human body keeps accumulating poisons from uh, foods and uh, various other things. Okay, so <clears throat> here is some analysis of uh, this example. Apart from the various uh, obvious revivalist and commercial biases, commercial in respect of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, presenter concludes by uh, this, uh, asking, suggesting that you buy this bottled uh, Gomutra from uh, which is marketed by various companies. Uh, um, revivalist and uh, commercial biases involved, there are so many things wrong with this. Neutralization of color, as we know, is a simple chemical process and there is nothing to suggest that the resulting transparent liquid is non-toxic. Uh, non so <coughs> uh, it may be or may not be, but the point is the, the, there is nothing that has been said about why the, trans the new transparent liquid is uh, like, just like the original water and non-toxic. Okay, uh, this, and this, there's another thing that was pointed out by Dhruv Ratin, uh, he may, who made a, made a video on uh, the original video, that, uh, the, that the process works just uh, the same way with human urine in place of uh, Gomutra. So the recommendation is fraught with uh, implications which may not seem as appealing unless you are a follower of uh, one of our former pr uh, prime ministers. Uh, <coughs> The conclusion presumes that the third point uh, to note, 
uh, um, uh, among others, is that the conclusion presumes that betadine is representative of the toxins that potentially enter our system, but no justification for this is uh, given or discussed. Okay, so the, <coughs> here I discussed a simple-minded example. Uh, <coughs> often there are statements made citing uh, very elaborate uh, scientific research, etc. Mostly they are fake uh, citations, uh, and when there is uh, some truth there, there, it's of dubious value. So here are some of the questions that one can ask to address the uh, doubtful parts. So is there a source cited? That's one question I would ask. It's usually not cited. Most of the WhatsApp messages and uh, social media messages never cite any source. It's just forwarded from, uh, no, from uh, and one doesn't know where the origin was uh, and wh whether it is credible. What is the process by which the conclusion was arrived at? <coughs> one should wonder. Uh, one should be wary of anecdotal evidence. Now, uh, as I emphasized in the beginning, knowledge is something uh, of a collective understanding and isolated individual experiences count for little. Not that they don't count, but uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, their value needs to be re uh, strictly considered in its own, on its own. Uh, appeal to authority is also often uh, used to uh, bolster a point. So and so scientists from Princeton, uh, etc. Et so uh, <coughs> this is again of limited value unless the question is not whether so who said it and what is the uh, <coughs> where he is what he is associated with, but whether it is uh, supported by scientific tests. Of course, uh, I mean the. The uh, best thing that could happen is that we can test ourselves, but this is a very limited uh, possibility because the whole, uh, whole variety of claims are beyond our reach. And what we can test is, uh, what we can try to understand is whether it has been scientifically tested by people who are reliable, the scientific laboratories, the journals, and there is a whole uh, scientific paraphernalia that fortunately for us that is uh, uh, available and even the information about it is available on the internet if you go to various uh, right sites and that, that would be the test. Uh, another point I would like to make is that co correlation is not always a reliable inference. It's very, uh, very often uh, the, 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 the graphs drawn and then one compares and then uh, uh, there are arguments. And I, I think I'll, I'll not spend time on that. But co uh, one should, uh, <coughs> you can uh, think about it yourself that uh, uh, two, the two graphs can uh, match just with, uh, in the practical context with, with a small uh, pixel size. And the pro if you com compute the probability of that, it's not uh, <coughs> too, uh, very, very small. And looking at the number of instances that we, uh, a variety of things to which you can do, they, there'll be many, many correlating things that would correlate but will not correspond to, uh, uh, correspond causally. Okay, here are some more considerations. Uh, <coughs> So uh, when a journal or a similar source is cited, it's important to consider the past record and its credibility. Uh, the sample size, as you know, needs to be adequate. Uh, <coughs> whether it was, uh, there, there's another uh, thing that I would particularly caution is that sometimes the, 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 the <coughs> whether, whether what is observed actually <coughs> Uh, leads to the claimed conclusion. I mean, this can, sort of can be seen in the example that I uh, described, discussed. But uh, there's a general uh, fact that one can notice that very often some, something that is given as a conclusion, if you look at it closely, not just from the surface and not based on an emotional attachment, etc., then you can see that the, the, uh, the, the, it's not a logical, correct inference. Now, reproducibility is another. Uh, <coughs> test, so whether, whether the same thing ha would happen and uh, one can also, also ask whether the same uh, <coughs> analogous things were, were, are also so to, put, uh, to put the uh, statement in a wider context and see whether it's uh, uh, stable in the sense that even variations can, uh, are actually true is, would, would be a certain test. Now, <coughs> here is the the last uh, thing I'd like to talk, talk about. Uh, falsifiability, this is one of the tests. I mean, this is somewhat independent of uh, the other things, but I just want to uh, uh, mention this. This is an important test for a claim. Falsifiability has been, uh, in the philosophy of science, has been one of the important uh, criteria, going back to Karl Popper and, uh, and others. So unless there is a test that can give, uh, that can negate 
uh, the claim, if it is false, the claim is inconsequential. And here is an example. Uh, very often it's said, so you, you uh, I'll, not, I'll not describe the context, but you will see, you, uh, I suppose you would understand uh, where it comes from. Uh, <coughs> something bad will happen if you sleep uh, with your feet towards uh, the east. Okay, this, this, uh, uh, this is a very common uh, kind of uh, uh, superstition. And uh, uh, the, this statement is really inconsequential from an uh, epistemological knowledge point of view because uh, it is not uh, it's not falsifiable. But, and the point is, what is bad is not specified. It's not saying that uh, your blood pressure will go up uh, by a certain, uh, certain de degrees if you do that, or uh, <coughs> you will, your sugar will increase or anything like that. It's, it's just saying something bad. So <coughs> no matter uh, whatever happens, it can always be interpreted. Even actually, even if you, if you strike a lottery, uh, it can still be argued that it's bad because it's going to lead you to, into bad habits. So uh, something, <coughs> something bad will happen is uh, not a kind of conclusion can, that can be admitted in term, uh, <coughs> as a uh, valid uh, uh, the conclusion for a, for a statement. Okay, so with this, I thank you all for, the, for your attention and uh, happy explorations.